True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. On May 20th, 1988, 30-year-old Lori Dan left poisoned snacks and juice boxes at several houses, started a fire that nearly killed a mother and her two children, and she sprayed bullets inside of an elementary school classroom. After years of living with a serious mental illness, she'd made a plan to hurt everyone she believed had slighted her, as well as others who were completely innocent. But there had been signs that Lori was a danger to herself and others. In fact, in hindsight, her rampage was entirely predictable. Join us at the quiet end for a ticking time bomb, Lori Dan. Lori grew up as an awkward child whose parents made perfunctory and misguided efforts at helping her. As an adult, her so-called quirks progressed into full-blown psychotic episodes. But, for a variety of reasons, Lori never received the intensive psychiatric treatment that she needed, and this left the lives of everyone in her path at risk. But what could have been done to stop her? Let's talk it out over a cold brew. Okay, I've got a good one for you. I've been waiting for an Illinois case because I wanted to review a Bourbon County brand stout from Goose Island Beer Company in Chicago. This is one of the best beers you'll ever drink, kiddies. It's an imperial stout. It's a big heavy hitter, 14.7% alcohol by volume. Black, has a thin tan head, wonderful aroma, chocolate, some roasted malt, bourbon, even a little smoke in there. Then we have a taste of sweet chocolate, coffee, vanilla, oak, and bourbon. Big beer. Sip it, share it, enjoy it. Okay, sounds good. Let's open it up. Okay, so before we go down to the quiet end, I just want to give a shout out to Laura G. from Wisconsin who recommended this case a few months ago. So thanks, Laura. Interesting case, I gotta tell you. Isn't it though? It's really kind of horrific. But just seeing how it played out in hindsight is really fascinating. It is, and, and frustrating. Yeah, it's a horror show. Come on down to the quiet end and you can start us out as usual. Okay. So Lori's father, Norm Wasserman, had just entered high school when his father died suddenly from a heart attack. Now, Norm had always been a good son, quiet, hardworking. He had an older sister, but Norm took on many more responsibilities once his father had died. He enrolled in college in downtown Chicago after high school, and he studied business for a year before leaving in 1950, just short of getting his degree. Now that same year, Norm married Edith Joy Lewis. This is a quiet girl who was one year behind him in school, and she had grown up in an apartment building just a block away from the Wassermans. The newlyweds moved into an apartment above a store just blocks from where they'd both grown up. Norm studied to take the certification exam to become a public accountant, and he passed that in 1952. Edith was already pregnant with her first child by then. Norm, the father, he was a smart enough guy as a CPA, did quite well. Yeah. So Norm and Edith's son, Mark, was born at the same hospital where Norm had been born 23 years earlier. Their apartment wasn't big enough to raise a family, so Norm and Edith built a house on family land in the nearby Stony Island Heights neighborhood. Now, this was a nice area populated by mostly upper middle class Jewish families. And there were so many doctors' families living there that for a while it was called Pill Hill. Now Norm's accounting practice was successful, and in 1957 the couple had their second child, a daughter, and this was Lori. Norm was the provider and Edith was the caregiver and disciplinarian. But by the early 1960s, the neighborhood became more working class, and they didn't like that. Norm and Edith wanted to move into one of the exclusive homes near the lake in Highland Park. But they had to settle for a more affordable brick house in the less fashionable southwest side of the city. The Wassermans bought the last house on the block 
and the other families noticed that they didn't seem very friendly. They sometimes drove out of the neighborhood the long way, seemingly to avoid passing by and waving at their neighbors, so seems like they didn't even want to do that much. When Edith did drive by people, they said she would stare straight ahead or sometimes even turn her head away. So I think she thought she was a little too good for that neighborhood. And a lot of the other women in the neighborhood believe that Edith saw her children as better than the other kids on the street. Mark, Lori's brother, was older than most of the other neighborhood kids. And he had friends over once in a while to play board games, but he was quite shy. In contrast, as Lori grew up, she was often outside playing with the neighborhood kids. These were mostly boys on the block and they played games like kickball, tag, and hide and seek. So more active outdoor stuff. Yeah, uh, just typical games of uh, kids in the 50s. Right. So Lori was quiet and kind of an odd looking little girl with an oversized nose and some protruding ears. The kids were okay with her most of the time, but sometimes they did tease her because she would just kind of stare off into space. Once in a while, Edith would let her invite some of the younger girls to their house, and the house was always immaculate, and Lori had a very enviable collection of Barbie dolls. The household, though, was intimidating, and Edith was nicknamed the bitch by some of the girls. And I guess this came about first when they would overhear Edith yelling for Lori to come in because she hadn't completed her chores. And I guess that Edith could be very demanding. She ran the household, remember? That's true, yeah. She's the disciplinarian. So, but yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a flag that she thought she was better than the other people in the neighborhood and uh, didn't want to drive through the neighborhood because she'd have to acknowledge people or something. Well, and to so, me, that kind of makes it seem like maybe Edith did have mental health issues. Right. I mean, back then, they usually weren't really addressed, were they? So that could be it too. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Okay. So Lori went to elementary school, which is just four blocks from her home. In class, she was known as a serious, shy girl. And she wasn't half the student her brother Mark had been. When she was in the fourth grade, Lori had corrective surgery on her ears. So she got to wear bandages on her head for a couple of weeks, and then her ears didn't stick out anymore. Yeah, her parents sent her to summer camp in Eagle River, Wisconsin over the summers when she was in elementary school. And she stayed at camp for eight weeks, swimming and sailing and horseback riding and playing games and doing crafts. So eight weeks back in the day, that's pretty much the whole summer break. And that's what summer camp is in many ways, right? If you yeah. can afford it, that's certainly a thing. But she, so she wasn't at home goofing around or doing kid things at home. She was sent off to camp. Yes. And then when she got back from camp, she was pretty much starting school again. Yeah, and she was a decent student in junior high. She also attended classes and group counseling, though, for learning disabled children at another junior high nearby. But I think Edith kind of wanted to keep that on the down low. So her classmates at her main school had no idea about this. So what are we looking at? This is elementary school? And junior high. And junior high. And she's already exhibited some problems because she's in the uh, learning disabled school in addition to the regular school. That's one thing. And then another concerning thing is the idea that Edith seemed to want to hide it. Yeah. Or maybe Norm did too. Or maybe Laurie did too. Yeah, but then you're kind of giving the child a message that there's something wrong with that, which I don't think is good. I think you need to raise kids to understand that everybody has issues and it's okay to get help. Well, of course. But of course, society didn't work that way. And hopefully now it's starting to work that way a little bit. Maybe it's heading in that direction. Yeah. The area where Lori grew up was very stressful and high pressure for teenagers there. The high schools there are some of the best in the country, and most of the students come from wealthy, educated families, so the expectations for academic and social success are so high that even an average kid could feel inferior and like a failure. Now, in fact, according to the book Murder of Innocence, which is about this case by authors Joel Kaplan, George Papajohn, and Eric Zorn, teenagers on the North Shore of Chicago take their own lives at a rate three times higher than the national average. Significant. Yes. So a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. Now, in her special education class, 
Lori said that she didn't feel like she was good at anything, that she couldn't talk to her parents, and she didn't feel loved or needed. However, when anyone offered advice to her, Lori would become angry and lash out at them. It seemed that there was definitely more to her introverted personality and emotional insecurity than simple unhappiness or normal adolescent angst. As early as five years old, Lori was performing rituals like touching objects over and over and fixating on what she saw as good numbers and bad numbers. These rituals became less pronounced as she got older, but on her mother's side there was a history of clinical depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD. Okay. Now, in 1971, Lori started high school, but she really struggled with her classes. After her brother Mark's success, Lori's performance was really a big disappointment. Mark had made the National Honor Society, and he had a 4.5 grade point average. Mark went on to one of the top state schools in the country, where he studied economics and would earn an honors degree. So that adds to the pressure, of course, if you have an older sibling. Oh, yes. Now, in the summer before high school, Lori's body had matured, and now she had curves, so she was catching the attention of the teenage boys. And one popular 10th grader noticed Lori, and he thought, you know, he'd like to uh, fool around or even have sex with her, even though he thought her face was funny looking. So, when she was in the cafeteria one day, this guy turned to Lori and said, You, you're going out with me. So Lori was surprised she had no experience with boyfriends, and she said okay. So he'd meant it as a joke at the time, but they ended up going out. He dated her for two months, and they did a lot of making out, heavy petting as they'd call it, but the relationship started to embarrass him in front of his popular friends. So this must have been really difficult for her because he'd see her, but then he'd avoid her in the halls, like he was embarrassed to be near her. And then he finally did break up with her. And when he did that, she was furious and she hated him. From then on, if he saw her in the school halls, she was glaring at him. And that would really be a taste of what was yet to come in her life. She did get angry. And she maintained a grudge. Yes, definitely. So when she was in the 10th grade, over Christmas break, she met a guy named Barry. And this is while waiting at the departure gate at O'Hare Airport. Their families were both taking the same 10-day tour to Hawaii, and Barry's father recognized Norm from their high school days together. So Barry was a senior at a private high school. Lori was shy around him at first, but they developed a friendship on the flight. Later, Barry and Lori walked together on the beach and spent some time alone. They were even able to sneak into a hotel room together, where things got a little hot and heavy. And on the return trip, Lori sat on Barry's lap. Once home, their relationship continued. They dated every weekend. In the afternoons, they would sit in her bedroom and listen to Brown Eyed Girl by Van Morrison, Lori's favorite song. One of my favorite songs, too. It's a nice song, yeah. Barry graduated in June, and Lori wrote in his yearbook, I know you'll have a good time in college, and I'll come to see you even if you don't want me. I have to see how you do. I would never be able to forget you, and I'll always love you. Lori. So what's this thing, uh, I'll come to see you even if you don't want me? There's yeah. a little bit of a red flag. Well, and, and Sounds like he might have kind of broken up with her. It sounds like that, doesn't it? Yeah. But Edith was focused around this time on the family's planned move. They were moving one town over to Glencoe. This was the second wealthiest area on the North Shore. And Edith had found a single-story L-shaped ranch on a large lot. It had five bedrooms, three bathrooms, and a finished basement. So it's a good-sized house in a good neighborhood. Yeah. But it's a really modest place by Glencoe standards. Still a really big step up for the Wasserman family. Well, yeah, because at least Edith wasn't real happy with the place they were in. You know, I don't know if Edith was ever really happy, Dickie. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. Uh-uh. So while most teenagers might have found changing high schools difficult, the move gave Lori a chance to start over with a new group of students and teachers. Academically, her sophomore year had been just as bad as her freshman year. So that's the what, C's and D's. Both she and her parents hoped that things would improve at the new school. Now as part of this new start, Lori had a nose job over the summer. She had been complaining about her nose being too big for years. After the surgery, the change in her looks was absolutely amazing. She became a beautiful young woman. 
The neighbors could barely believe that this was the same Laurie Wasserman, and she began turning the heads of teenage boys. Yeah, beautiful might be a bit of an overstatement from what I've seen, but she was pretty enough. She did have dates after starting at the new high school. Still, she did stay in contact with Barry. Barry even tried to get her to consider the University of Illinois when it came time to apply to college, but Lori told him she wanted to go farther away for school, maybe to Arizona. The weather was better there, and the parties were wilder, she said. But in truth, she really didn't have the grades for Illinois or Arizona. So when Barry asked her if she would go with him and his family to Canada on vacation, she agreed, but then she backed out at the last minute. And on the night before Barry was leaving, he got a phone call from a boy, like a teenage boy. And the boy identified himself as a student at Lori's school, and he told Barry that he was going out with Lori. He added that he and Lori had been having sex. So Barry was quite stunned and hurt, and that was pretty much the end of his relationship with Lori. Despite her poor grades, Lori was able to get into Drake University and this is a small private school in Des Moines. This was known as one of the colleges of last resort for underachievers from the North Shore. So she enrolled in the fall of 1975 and took classes in education to prepare her for a career as an elementary school teacher. So she did earn A's, B's, and C's because she worked harder than before, trying to get her grades up because she really wanted to transfer to another school, especially the University of Arizona. So after her freshman year, Lori sent her transcripts to Arizona, and she was accepted into the College of Liberal Arts, where she, again, took courses in education. Later, she switched to the Home Economics Department in the College of Agriculture, and she studied merchandising of clothing. So with this specialty, a student could get a middle management job in retail clothing sales, and this was something she already knew quite a bit about. Her dad, Norm, had done accounting work for many women's stores in the Chicago area, and he'd been able to get a lot of good deals for both Lori and Edith because they liked expensive clothes. So she thought that's something maybe she could do. Yeah, however, her grades were below a C average her first semester, so she was on academic probation at her sorority during the second semester. Then, after taking off with guys and additionally having guys visit her room in the sorority, in the middle of the night, heavens, <laughs> Lori quit school. The summer after her first year, she returned to the Midwest and took a two-credit home economics course at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She rented an exclusive private dorm at her parents' expense. Now, a 27-year-old guy who dated her that summer would say that Lori was extroverted, talking to strangers at bars when they're out together, and even openly flirting with them. He so soon broke things off, saying that she was shallow and spoiled. I could kind of see that at this point. Now, she was definitely on the lookout for a boyfriend, and she went through a variety of kind of unremarkable guys, I guess. But then she found Stephen Witt, and she really liked him. He was a handsome Jewish pre-med student, and they were in the same psychology class in the spring of 1978. But they actually didn't meet each other until they saw each other at a party that fall and he asked her out to a football game. So these two seemed like the perfect match, two good-looking but insecure people who both needed a lot of attention. <laughs> they fit well together. Yes, a lot of codependency going on. So it didn't take long before they were telling each other they were in love, and they took swing dance classes, tried out new restaurants, and went together to the popular clubs. But no matter what Steve did, nothing seemed to quell Lori's insecurities. She became enraged or pouted whenever he spoke to another woman for more than just a few seconds. And then Steve's friends told him that they saw her as self-centered and stuck up because she talked too much about her father's money and she really did try to control everything that Steve did. So even Steve was becoming tired of that. Yeah, before he was with Lori, Steve had hated the long hours he needed to spend in the library with other pre-med students. But as her dependence on him increased, he found himself kind of looking forward to hiding behind his studies. You know, I'd like to be with you tonight, Lori, but I gotta go study for an exam. It's a good excuse because she really wanted to be married to a doctor. Yep. Now, it was a good excuse for him to get some needed space. And as an added benefit, he actually did study and he got straight A's. So see what that can do? Yeah. 
Now, at the same time, he kept the romance with Laurie going on, more for convenience than anything else. He lasted two more semesters. But between keeping up with classes and trying to prepare for the MCATs, the medical school admission test, he just didn't have the time to build up a new social life. And Laurie was always there. So Steve's looking at her as someone who took care of him, loved him, and praised him. Yeah, so he's kind of using her. But at the same time, I don't think she would have taken kindly to a breakup. No, she wouldn't have. So after a summer trip together, Steve returned to Arizona to take classes, and he volunteered in a hospital. Lori stayed behind to work for the summer as a waitress. As Steve drove away from her, he was feeling even more uncertain than ever about this relationship. They did stay faithful to each other over that summer and wrote or called each other pretty often. Then in the fall, they moved into separate furnished apartments in the same complex. Lori was actually sharing an apartment with three other girls, but she rarely spent any time with them. She pretty much lived with Steve, and she did his laundry and cooked and cleaned, which allowed him to keep focused on getting into medical school. So of course this was convenient for him, but he worried that she was too dependent on him. In the winter semester, Steve told Lori that because he hadn't been admitted to medical school yet, he decided to go away to the University of Southern California for dental school the next fall. And he told her he didn't want her coming with him. So, ouch, she was devastated. Yeah, that's, that's the worst news. Yeah. So apparently she cried and begged him and promised to be less possessive. And Steve felt bad for her and he did weaken a little bit. And he told her, well, maybe once he had some time alone, things would look different. And at Steve's recommendation, Lori saw a social worker at a student clinic to help her learn to be less needy and less possessive. Steve even went along with her to the first couple of appointments. But he gave that up when Lori blamed him for all of their problems and found excuses for her own behavior. So Steve was nervous that spring. He'd been accepted at Southern Cal for med school but he was still holding out for the Arizona College of Medicine, where he was on the waiting list. And when he was accepted to the medical college at Arizona, he didn't tell Lori. He got a new apartment across campus with a male roommate. That's subtle. Well, you know, I think it was kind of difficult. I'm not going to let him off the hook completely. But when someone's that clingy, she kind of wouldn't take no for an answer a lot of the times, it seems. Oh, no kidding. Now, when she did realize it was over between them, Lori was crushed. Her fantasies of the two of them getting married, raising a family, having a lot of money, they were all gone. She called her mother for consolation. But Edith, who was never really emotionally responsive to her daughter, just said, you'll find another boyfriend. Yeah, so not yeah, great. That'll help. Not great. Lori withdrew from Arizona in July of 1980. Before she left, Steve promised that they would see each other in Boca Raton, Florida, at her parents' vacation condo during Christmas break, and he told her, then we can see how things go. Lori was just over 20 credit hours short of the hours she needed for her degree, and she planned to finish up at Northwestern University and live at home with her parents. Lori believed that she was meant for a career in psychology, teaching, or nursing, and in the fall of 1980, she wanted to try out Northwestern University, so she signed up to audit a psychology course. But it didn't take long before she was complaining that she was bored, and she dropped out. Lori and Steve talked on the phone once in a while, and she continued to hope that things with him would work out, because she really just wanted to be a mom and a wife, and be like her mother. But when that anticipated week in Boca Raton finally arrived, nothing really seemed the same between them. Steve had moved on with life, but Lori was stuck. So they played some tennis, they walked on the beach, and they even did have sex a couple of times. But then when it was time for Steve to leave for the airport, Norm alone drove him. And a couple of weeks later, Steve officially broke up with her over the phone. But still, over the next several months, Lori would call Steve and beg him over and over to take her back. And this is something that she would do later in life for sure. Had a hard time letting go. Truly, and truly a hard time. So the next summer, Lori signed up for Introduction to Sociology and Social Problems in Northwestern's Continuing Education Program, but then she suddenly withdrew. And then in the fall of that same year, she signed up for dance, acting, and playwriting classes. She didn't finish those classes either. Still, to the outside world, 
Lori seemed to be happy, and she had a very attractive appearance. She continued to really want the college experience, so she moved into a northwestern dorm on Chicago's Gold Coast. Yes, yeah, so once she was there, the men in the building were very taken with Lori. The only strange thing they noticed about her was that she was always wearing purple, which was one of Northwestern school colors. She helped support herself by working as a cocktail waitress at Green Acres, and this was an all-Jewish golf and tennis club. She'd had similar waitressing jobs when she was in high school, but this place had a large number of single men who were there often. So on one busy night in 1981, she got the attention of one of the club members. He was cute, and she noticed him catching her eye all throughout his dinner. So on his way out afterwards, he approached her and struck up a conversation with her. So this was Russell Dan. Yeah, he was a 25-year-old sales executive for his family's insurance company. He was confident, outgoing, and Lori thought that he looked a lot like Davy Jones, one of the four members of the Monkees. Their 1960s TV show was still in syndication, and it was one of Lori's favorites. Russell and Lori were similar in that they were both the youngest children in wealthy Jewish families. They had both had trouble early on in school, and they had both gone to the same high school at one time as well. But in a lot of ways, they were very different. Russell was outgoing and fun-loving, and Lori was, uh, well, she was Lori. Yeah, but Russell quickly fell in love with her. He thought that she was the sweetest, most attractive girl he'd ever met. She also had a family his family would approve of. When Lori and Russell were first beginning to date, Russell was in charge of making an insurance presentation to a chain of women's clothing stores, for which Norm Wasserman was the accountant. So Norm was this smart, friendly man, and Russell's father, Armand, really liked him. By that time, Norm had branched out into investing, and he was part of a trust that owned an apartment building in Chicago, condos in the suburbs, and even a shopping center in Northbrook. So Russell and Norm shared an interest in finances, and they both also played tennis. So Norm was really happy with Russell. Yeah, and it seems like Norm has really done well financially. Oh, absolutely. And Russell was pretty well off. Yeah, he came from wealthy parents too, didn't he? Yeah, I think maybe a little bit wealthier than Lori's even. Now, even though Lori seemed perfect in many ways, she would occasionally lash out at Russell or throw tantrums over minor issues. Russell's relatives and friends had their doubts about her from the beginning. And we've heard this before. I mean, most everybody <laughs> who's gone out with her, their friends have said, eh, we're not so sure about Lori. Red flags, right? Yeah. Yeah. A close uncle of Russell's thought Lori was way too reserved for Russell. And friends who'd known Russell since grade school thought Lori was boring and really had nothing to offer. They were also concerned about Lori seeming totally wrapped up in Russell's world to the point of not having interests of her own. She seemed to cling to him constantly and made no efforts to socialize with other people. Yeah. So nine months after they started dating, Russell and Lori went to Boca Raton to spend the holidays with her parents. Now during that visit, they took a long walk together and Russell said he'd been thinking maybe they should get married. So Lori agreed she was very happy and they went back to the condo and told her parents. All throughout the relationship, Russell didn't know that Lori really wasn't a student at Northwestern at all. She told him she was dropping out because planning their wedding was just too much for her and that she was moving back home. Then she got a full-time job as a receptionist. But on her application for the job, she lied, saying that she had worked three years at the Dan's family insurance business where Russell worked. And she said she had an accounting degree from the University of Arizona. So she only lasted five weeks there and then she quit, telling her supervisor that the job wasn't challenging enough for her. But in reality, she wasn't doing a good job there. She wasn't qualified. Yeah, and she had no business being at that job. No. Because Lori really didn't have any friends, Russell's sister Susie agreed to be her maid of honor, and she and her husband Jeff, who was a wealthy banker, hosted a big party at their house and they invited over 50 people who were mostly Russell's friends. Susie was skeptical but held back on judging Lori. She did seem nice enough, and Susie trusted her brother's decisions, but she did find it odd that Lori never even thanked her for hosting the party. Yeah, and I'll bet that was a lavish party. I'm sure it was, yeah. And Lori just didn't seem socially really with it, because these people were very together. 
very successful, socially comfortable, and she just really didn't fit in, it seems. So for the wedding, the Wassermans had 45 guests, allowing only 20 for the dance. Only three or four of those on Lori's side were her friends, and the rest were relatives or friends of her parents. After a honeymoon in the British Virgin Islands, the couple moved into Russell's townhouse in Northbrook. Soon after that, Lori began doing little rituals that Russell hadn't seen her do before. For example, she'd open the car door at a stoplight and tap her foot on the pavement or she'd walk down a street touching every telephone pole and then hopping over the cracks in the sidewalk. Then she wouldn't put lids back on containers, and she refused to let Russell leave for work in the morning until she had put her hand a certain way on the sofa, and she told him something bad will happen if I don't do it. So some serious OCD. Yeah, I mean, that, somehow she had managed to suppress those symptoms for years, and now they're returning. Yeah, well, I'm sure when she was dating him, she didn't want him to know. Oh, yeah. So, it was still early on, and Russell shrugged off this odd behavior, and she wasn't hurting anyone. This kind of ritualistic behavior can happen in response to stress and feelings of helplessness, according to psychiatrists. So, Lori admitted to Russell that she felt badly outclassed by the other women in his life. For example, Susie, his sister, was a former school teacher and a mother of three and Russell's mother Elaine was a successful commodities broker. So Lori really felt inferior. And with time, Lori's rituals made it difficult for her to meet the normal daily requirements of life. One of the first things Russell noticed was how she kept a linen closet. Lori threw all her clothes, both clean and dirty, inside on the floor. The rest of the space was filled with household objects she picked up while supposedly cleaning. And Russell built a second closet downstairs but that one got even worse after a couple of weeks. Her sloppiness was really upsetting for Russell, because he's kind of a neat nick, and everything has to be in place for him, at least when he is there living on his own. So he sat down with Lori, his new wife, and helped her to make step-by-step -step plans to organize everything. So that's good, except that it didn't work. Go for a day or two and things would get a little better, but then inevitably she'd slip back into her old ways. Well, she seemed to have a real lack of motivation, and she had these peculiar rituals, so it made it impossible for her to keep a job. Just months after the wedding, she was working as a waitress at a restaurant and sports bar, and Russell stopped by for a drink one day, and he wondered why he didn't see her there. She told him that she was working that evening, so he asked the manager if she was working, and then he learned that she'd been fired after having some kind of altercation with a female customer. So, after that, she was just moving from one job to another and getting fired every time. After she'd been through about a dozen employers, Russell sat her down for a talk about her future. And he told her, you know, you really don't need to make money. You can just volunteer somewhere. So, she did try a few volunteer positions, but nothing seemed to last. Then she would just spend her days shopping, going out to lunch with her mom, sleeping, and watching TV. And when Russell would come home... She'd just hop in the shower and act like she'd been busy, but some days she'd just be in bed all day. So there had to be a certain amount of depression there. I would think. And she's sleeping the day out? Yeah. Now, when they did have friends over, Russell would do all the setup and all the cleaning. Once he put Laurie in charge of the snacks for a party, but she got so worried that she wouldn't have the pretzels and chips ready in time that she set them out on the counter a week early. <laughs> So by the time the guests arrived, the uh, snacks were soggy and stale. That's pretty crazy. Then there's the time she agreed to take charge of side dishes for a barbecue, and she served rotten potatoes and frozen vegetables. Russell would do almost all the talking for both of them when they went out together, but Lori still occasionally would say some awkward things, or laugh inappropriately at one of her stories that no one else found amusing, or even understood, for that matter. And this is pretty weird, because with her college boyfriend, she was cleaning, doing laundry, making his meals, and now she's married to Russell, and she doesn't seem capable of that stuff. So something has changed for the worse. Well, you, you could say she was doing all that stuff for the first guy because she wasn't married to him, and she wanted to show what a good wife she'd be. Sure. And then with Russell, they're already married. 
Screw it, I don't have to do anything. I suppose, but just being married doesn't mean that he can't leave her. Maybe she felt that way. But I just feel like maybe her mental condition was deteriorating as well. It could indicate that too, right? Yeah. I mean, she's in her 20s, or mid-20s. Mm-hmm. A lot of mental disease can start showing up at that age. Yeah, that's true. Good point. So after they were married for about a year and a half, it became clear that Lori wouldn't be able to solve her own problems, and Russell couldn't do it for her either. So they decided that she would see a psychiatrist, but she said she'd only go if Russell would swear not to tell anyone. So here's like what I was talking about earlier with Edith is she doesn't want anyone to know they're not perfect. And that certainly was handed down to Lori. Although Lori would certainly let that go over time. But as far as seeing a psychiatrist, she was embarrassed about it. Right. So Russell agreed he wouldn't tell anyone. And Lori began going to psychiatrist Dr. Robert Greendale every Thursday. In the first month, he put her on thioridazine. Greendale has never publicly revealed his diagnosis for Lori. But that drug he prescribed is known as a major tranquilizer, prescribed for short-term treatment of depression, anxiety, and agitation. It's also used to treat psychosis. Now, Russell noticed that the thioridazine helped level out her unpredictable mood swings. So that's good. But it didn't help with her more severe symptoms. Now, he went with her to one of the therapy sessions when Dr. Greendale was trying to help her control her ritualistic behaviors. Lori explained that she was troubled by bad thoughts and that she used her superstitions to ward off these thoughts and prevent harm from coming to Russell. That's well, a thing. Yeah, that's a worrisome thing. Well, yes, it definitely is. Uh, I don't know if she specified what these bad thoughts were, which would seem important. But Lori didn't like therapy because the results were not immediate. So she missed her fourth appointment and then called the next week to say she was never coming back. So Dr. Greendale was alarmed by this, and he did write a letter to her. So the letter said in part, I feel compelled to send you a letter as a follow-up to our very brief telephone discussion today. I am genuinely concerned about your ability to cope with the problems that you've been struggling with. I think it's important for you to realize, if you don't already, that the nature of your problems goes back long before you married your husband, and it relates very much to your childhood upbringing. Although your husband certainly demonstrated a tremendous amount of understanding and support in his visit with the two of us in the office, I do not feel that he has the training or certainly the objectivity to function in a professional manner. Furthermore, the use of medication can only result in a symptomatic improvement and not in a definitive cure for the kinds of difficulties that you're experiencing. Medication can also only be appropriately administered under an ongoing doctor's observation and care. In conclusion, I would hope that you would reconsider your decision about coming in for psychotherapy, inasmuch as I feel that it is of extreme importance that you reconsider getting some kind of professional help. So there's some effort there by her doctor. Yeah, I think that's a, a major effort. I mean, this is not something that would be commonly done by a doc. No. To write a letter like that. So he must have been fairly concerned about her mental state. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he was. When Russell read the letter, he wasn't surprised that the doctor had identified Lori's family life as the source of her problems. Because he'd already noticed that Lori's behavior improved a lot whenever Norm and Edith were away in Florida. So Lori told Russell that her mother had given her no sympathy when she was a child. So if she'd hurt herself or get sick, Edith just couldn't be bothered. She also criticized her to her face and behind her back, and her brother Mark had always been the favorite child, which isn't really surprising. No. I mean, look at my sister complaining. Yeah, well. Okay. She's got good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I was the favorite. Oh, yes, I'm sure you were. So Russell took the letter from Dr. Greendale with him one day when he and Norm went fishing, and during a quiet moment, he read it aloud. Norm had no response at first, and then when Russell asked him what he thought, Norm said, There's really not that much of a problem here. It's a non-issue. I don't believe in psychiatry. I just don't believe in that kind of stuff. So we're not going to get any help there. So you can see how her parents are kind of terrible. A lot of denial. So in an effort to improve the marriage, Russell suggested that he and Lori move out of the condo and get a house. Now, I don't know why he thought that would help, 
but he said maybe it would be easier for her to stay organized if they had a bigger house. So he had a lot of money. He purchased a large home in a wealthy neighborhood, but then on their first day in the new house, he could see that just changing their address wasn't going to change anything. As the movers were bringing furniture in the door and asking Lori where to put things, she could not decide, and she just had a meltdown. Then she started doing other weird stuff. She refused to use the back staircase, which she called unlucky. And then she developed an aversion to even casual physical contact, so much so that she couldn't even hand something to another person without dropping it or tossing it to them. Then she began spreading trash all over their beautiful house. She left money in the oven and the freezer, and she put all her makeup in the microwave. So her husband realized that his wife was not well, but he was working and exhausted and felt pretty helpless at that point. He didn't know what to call her condition even, so he didn't know what to do about it. So for a while, he just tried to pretend that it wasn't so bad and kind of compensate for the things that she did or didn't do. Yeah, now is, is she seeing a psychiatrist at this point, or is she not seeing him or sporadically seeing him? I think it's sporadic, but more not than yes. More time if, without therapy. If I'm living with someone with these symptoms, boy, I'd be pushing for that you got to see a professional. And she doesn't have children or jobs, so she could be like in a day program. Yeah. Because she did need some serious help, and things got worse. Well, and his family urged him to break off the marriage once they heard about her psychological problems. But Russell, at least at this point, was loyal and determined to make things work. He looked at it as that Lori was sick, and he wasn't going to abandon her just because of her illness. Well, sure, but things didn't get any better. No, they got worse. She began leaving food out to spoil, storing new clothes with the tags still on them in piles in the back seat of her car. And then she had this thing where she'd refuse to close cabinets or drawers in the house. She'd leave any drawer she opened or cabinet, she'd leave it wide open. So the house was such a mess that when a friend came over for a walk one day, Lori couldn't even find a pair of her own shoes to wear. So she grabbed Russell's sneakers and stuffed socks in the toes to make them fit. And the friend thought, well, this is really odd. Yeah, and if nobody stopped by, Lori would sleep all day in her sweatpants and sweatshirt. Then when Russell pulled into the garage after work, he would hear her get out of bed and turn on the shower. So he finally gave Lori an ultimatum. Either she went back to see Dr. Greendale or he's going to leave her. Yeah, so she did agree to go back, but her visits were erratic. She said that she couldn't keep on schedule with the medication because it nauseated her. Her realization that she might have inherited or developed a serious mental illness only made her behavior worse. She began to stay in bed even when guests would be there. And sometimes Russell would find her spaced out and afraid of leaving the bedroom at all. So his patience was really wearing out. They hadn't been married long at all. Their arguments over her refusal to get help would end with Russell storming out of the house. So he arranged to visit Dr. Greendale with Lori again, but when he went, he saw that Greendale didn't know the severity of her condition. She apparently hadn't told him about the most debilitating of her behaviors, and the way she'd really become a prisoner of this illness. Instead, she'd only been telling him about minor marital issues, like they needed marriage counseling. And so Russell decided he was going to ask Lori for separation. But before that, he went to warn Norman Edith. I wanted to do this before they took their winter trip to Florida. Now, after Russell explained what had been going on, Norm said, well, we should still go to Florida. They are no help. Not at all. And then when Russell finally did tell Lori that he was leaving her, she was devastated. She cried. Russell held her. They tried to call Norm and Edith in Boca Raton, but they were out. And then in the evening, they finally reached the Wassermans. Okay, Lori, hang in there, Norm said when Russell put Lori on the phone. Don't worry about it. We'll be back in a couple of weeks and we'll talk then. <laughs> so Lori, he didn't even want to come home early. No. Too bad you're, you're not doing well. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Exactly. Lori hung up and sobbed for several minutes. Russell was angry with her parents and he called Norm back. And then eventually, Norm and Edith did agree that they would come home the next day. So once Russell had left her, Lori still stayed at the house with him from time to time and they'd sleep in separate rooms, but they would have sex sometimes. His friends warned him that that was a really bad idea and he was giving Lori false hope. 
And that was probably right. When Lori spoke to an old friend about the impending divorce, Lori swore that the marriage wasn't over. She wanted to be with Russell, and if that couldn't happen, she said she would make him suffer. So yikes, that's scary. <laughs> Sounds threatening. And this is when she started getting pretty threatening. Also, in an effort to get him back, she told him that she was pregnant. He told her that was unlikely because he'd been withdrawing before he ejaculated, because he didn't trust her to take her birth control. But she told him she'd been secretly collecting his semen and injecting it into herself with a syringe. But if she was doing that, it didn't work, and she was probably lying. Yeah, well, and, and that withdrawal doesn't work anyway. Usually not. So Lori began calling Russell and his friends and family members constantly, and then she'd hang up. When her parents went to Florida for six weeks, she staged a burglary and directed blame at Russell. Then in a short time after the burglary, Russell came home and found his dress shirts drenched with water. Lori was hiding in a closet, and she threatened him then, saying that if she couldn't have him, no one could. Yes, I guess at one point he would come home and she would be doing the laundry, but she wouldn't put the clothes in the dryer. She'd just fold them wet and put them in drawers and stuff, which of course would make mildew happen. <laughs> yes. So big mess. On May 5th, Lori went out and bought a gun. She and Russell had been separated for about six months by then. Lori went into the Marksman Police and Shooters Supply in Glenview and explained to the salesman that she needed something for protection. She was friendly and smiling as she looked around, and she decided on a $275 Smith & Wesson three fifty seven Magnum. It's, That's a big gun. It is. It's such a powerful weapon that some police departments don't even use it because some officers have a hard time passing the qualifying tests. Big gun. Dirty Harry gun, right? I think that, yeah. I think you're right. She also bought a gun cleaning kit and two boxes of ammunition. She had to fill out an application for an Illinois firearm owner's identification card, but that was just a formality. Getting the card is easier than getting a driver's license. So she just paid her $5, filled out a one-page questionnaire that, in 1986, asked only eight screening questions. Are you an illegal alien? Have you renounced your citizenship? Are you under indictment? Have you been convicted of a felony? Are you a fugitive? Do you use illegal drugs? Have you ever been in a mental institution? Were you dishonorably discharged from the armed forces? So she could honestly say no to all of those. Right. But she was very mentally ill. She was, but so she's never, never been hospitalized. No, nope, no, nope. probably should have been. Right. So she truthfully answered no to each question, and the salesman told her she could come back after the mandatory three-day cooling-off period. When she returned for the gun, Eugene Miller, a friend of the Dan family, happened to be there. He was buying ammunition for his handgun, and he recognized Lori and said hello to her. Then when he saw a salesman showing her how to use the new gun, he remembered some conversations he'd had with Russell's parents about the bitter divorce and Lori's emotional problems. So as soon as he got home, he called Russell's father, Armand Dan, to warn him. Armand wasn't home, so he called Armand's brother, Russell's uncle, who was able to reach Armand, who was out on a golf course. And when he heard about Lori's purchase, he was so upset that he called Russell to warn him. And Russell went to the police to tell them that his unstable estranged wife was now armed. But there was nothing illegal about it. Yeah, after using state records to find her application for a firearms card and confirming her purchase with a source at the store, an officer called Norm Wasserman in Florida to tell him. And Norm called up Lori before calling the officer back. He told the officer that Lori was planning on moving and wanted the gun for protection. The officer explained that the gun would more likely be turned on her if there was a break-in. But Norm insisted that having a gun was Lori's right. Yeah, he was really stuck on her having the right and not really thinking about her mental state at all. And how would she be protecting herself by having that gun? He really just didn't seem to get it or didn't want to be bothered. It's no. hard to tell. I don't think he gets it. No. So that officer was really concerned and not happy with Norm's response or what he saw as a lack of a response. So he called Lori himself, and she told him she had a right to have a gun. And she said she wasn't going to hurt anyone. So the officer followed up by going to talk to Dr. Greendale, 
Of course, he couldn't give any confidential information, but he did tell the officer that Lori was not suicidal or homicidal in his opinion. And I don't know at this point how often she was even seeing him. Right. Though I don't know. To me, that's just mildly reassuring. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't help much. No, not really. Now, the police continued to bring up the issue with the Wassermans. They tried many times to get Lori to give up the Magnum. The idea of Lori with a gun was pretty scary. Now, after a couple months, Norm finally seemed to be giving in on the issue. He promised that he and Lori had agreed to store the gun in a safe deposit box at the bank. He said the same thing in a phone conversation with Armand Dan, who had also been checking in with the police. But Armand was not at all reassured. He spoke to Norm, but Norm dismissed his concerns. And when the police asked Norm if they could look inside the safe deposit box, just to be sure the gun was there, Norm and Lori would not let them do that. Yeah, so that's kind of weird. So I'm thinking that... They're making it up. Right. There ain't no gun in a safe deposit box. And what good would that do? Why even have it? Doesn't make any sense. Nope. So at this time, the divorce was moving forward very slowly. There's all this hostility. And Norm was demanding that Russell support Lori for 10 years with $20,000 a month alimony after an initial $100,000 upfront payment. Nowadays, that's a lot of money. So that... It is. Bunch of money. So back then, that's a ton of money. Russell's attorney subpoenaed Lori's school records from Northwestern in order to show that she was an educated woman who could support herself. And this is when Russell finally learned that she hadn't been a graduate student when he met her, and she hadn't even completed her degree in Arizona. So all this time, she'd been lying to him about that. Yeah, so she's not going to be the high earner they were hoping. Well, no, but she could certainly have supported herself. Oh, sure. So Russell offered two years of alimony at $1,500 a month, along with the agreed-upon $100,000 payment. But Norm declined that offer. He told Russell's father that Russell's offer was unfair in view of how much money he made, and that if he didn't settle quickly, he would see to it that Lori was put into a mental institution and that Russell would be stuck supporting her for the rest of his life. So that's a hell of a thing to say about your daughter. No kidding. He actually said if Lori is crazy, then Russell's responsible. He ruined her. So things got very nasty between these two families. Yeah, they deteriorated fast. They wow. did. And this is a short marriage, so the divorce should have been very simple. Yeah, you know, Russell decided he just wanted to get out quickly so he could get along moving forward with his life. And he only had two demands. The first was for the return of the engagement ring, which had sentimental value to the family. And the second was for Lori to change her legal name back to Lori Wasserman and dissociate completely from the Dan family. He would even pay extra for the return of his name. But the ring was important to her, Lori claimed, and she liked Russell's last name. So the negotiations continued without really any progress being made. Well, she doesn't want the divorce, so of course she's going to put up these roadblocks. Yeah, I'm interested, though. I mean, her father's an accountant. Why is he acting as her lawyer? Yeah, I don't know. She may have had a lawyer, too, but it seems like Lori didn't do much for herself. Yeah. In August, Lori's old college boyfriend, Steve Witt, got another call from Lori, and the conversation started out as friendly, but then she said she had something serious to tell him. She said she had a five-year-old daughter that he had fathered during their last sexual encounter in Boca Raton just before they broke up. She said she was telling him now because her husband had decided to adopt the child legally, and she just wanted him to come to Chicago to see her and sign the papers. So I don't even know what the motivation here was. Just for attention, I guess. Or she's really just insane at that point. Yeah, because it's not going to help at all with her marriage. No, and there's no child. <laughs> yeah, there's Obviously. no child anyway. So. Yeah. So it seems like Russell wasn't listening to her, and she went back to uh, the college boyfriend. Yeah. And, and he was actually at the point of flying to Chicago to see Lori and his baby. But after talking more with Lori, Steve began noticing some inconsistencies about where and when his daughter had been born. And he also thought it was odd that she would never allow Russell to come to the phone. And she intermittently brought up child support payments. And he finally checked with all the area hospitals and decided that there is no child. Well, how would child support payments even be a thing if she said her husband was going to adopt the child? Well, precisely. Yeah, it's not making much sense. No, and when he did confront Lori with the facts, 
she admitted to making up the whole story. And Dr. Steve, he suggested that she seek professional mental health help. Oh, well, nobody would ever thought of that before. Isn't he a genius? Yeah, well, he's a doctor. <laughs> yeah. So he thought he'd kind of washed his hands of her, but she was going to go after him now. In September, an anonymous female called the Department of Dermatology at the New York Hospital and claimed that Dr. Steve Witt had raped her in the emergency room. So, of course, the charge was suspicious, especially since Steve hadn't even done an emergency room rotation yet. But Steve did feel threatened. He felt so threatened by this that he arranged to transfer back to Arizona and do his residency there. Now, he was married by then, and his wife Barbara stayed behind, so Lori harassed her with multiple late-night phone calls. And she said to the wife, you better get used to me. I'll follow you. I'll go to Arizona. I'll be on your doorstep. Steve will have to support me for the rest of my life. So that's a weird comment, too. It's all just very weird. Like, she's lost her mind at this point. Yeah, she's, she's stretched pretty thin right now. So the Wits had their attorney write a letter to Lori at her parents' address and threatened to sue them if that harassment continued. And her parents must have talked to her because it did stop for a short time. But she's still harassing Russell as well. Right. And she somehow managed to get a key to his house in the summer of 1986 so she could track his movements and she could look in his garage to see if his car was there. So now you're talking about Russell. We're back to Russell. Yeah. So he, Russell started hanging a dark towel over the garage window so he could prevent her from knowing of his home or if he had a female company. Notes and pictures started disappearing from the house. Files on his home computer were erased. So you got to think you know who was behind that. Oh, for sure he knew that. It was Tuesday, September 30th at about 3 in the morning when Russell was actually attacked in his home. He'd been sleeping in his bed when he suddenly woke up screaming in pain. He felt a sharp pain in his chest, and he jumped out of bed. He was confused about what was going on, and he walked around the bed and went to the bathroom. And when he looked in the mirror over his bureau, he saw a dark red wound in his chest, right above his heart. So at first, you know, he'd just woken up and he was confused. And he thought he might have a broken blood vessel or something. Some kind of cardiac incident had happened. But when he got back to bed, he also had trouble breathing. So he stood over his nightstand and reached for the phone. And when he looked down, he saw an ice pick. There was an ice pick lying between the bed and the headboard. So three police officers and an ambulance arrived at Russell's house minutes after his 911 call. They saw him standing on his balcony, waving them over. He waited until they were at his door before he went downstairs and let them inside. Of course, he knew the ice pick wasn't his. Nothing else upstairs had been disturbed, so it didn't appear to be a burglary. Now, the only reasonable conclusion was that Lori from whom he had been separated now for about a year, had tried to kill him, just as she had threatened she would. But the responding officers were somewhat skeptical, and that's probably uh, a mild thing. They thought he'd done this all himself. Yeah, I don't know why, I guess. Yeah. It's hard to imagine this young woman doing that, but also in their opinion, the stab wound didn't look very serious, so maybe they thought he'd staged it because of the domestic issues. Yeah. It hadn't bled much, and the hole was just at the location on his chest where a right-handed person might be able to stab himself if he wanted to make it look like he'd been attacked. Also, Russell had been asleep, so he hadn't seen his attacker. I have a tough time deciding that this is exactly the spot where a right-handed person would stab himself. <laughs> well, maybe not exactly. And this is just... But if you're a right-handed person, you'd probably stab your left chest more than your right, just well, because of how your arm would move. Sure, but that doesn't mean anything. Okay. Well, that's what the police thought. They were very suspicious of his story. They certainly were. So when he showed the officers some suspicious items lying on the first floor sofa, which included a ski mask, a flashlight, a can of mace, and a glass cutter, they just thought he probably planted them. Are you sure you haven't had a party here? One of the officers asked him, and that really made him mad because he felt like they were treating him like a crazy person. Yeah. So he tried to explain his story again this time making an effort to sound calm and logical. He first said he saw the ice pick under the bed, when what he meant was that he saw it between the bed and the headboard. The police asked him if he'd been drinking or if he'd taken any drugs, and he was just incredulous. They didn't believe him, so he was really frustrated. 
He called up his brother and he told the police, just leave, get out of my house. So it wasn't a good interaction between Russell and the police. No, it doesn't sound like it. So the responding officers had Russell sign a release to let the ambulance leave without him. But they followed when his brother drove him to the hospital. So in the emergency room, the doctor found that the ice pick had pierced muscle tissue and gone one inch into his chest, where it had caused a partial collapse of his left lung. So it got in far enough. So that's probably not something you'd do to yourself. I'm not sure that's something I could inflict on myself. That would be tough. And after the police told the doctor how strange Russell's story was, and how they thought he might have been stabbing himself, the doc went back for a closer look at the wound and noted several small linear abrasions that radiated outward from the central puncture. So he told the officers that these might be hesitation marks, the small cuts a person makes in moving a weapon tentatively around on the skin before getting up the nerve to plunge it all the way in. Well, yeah, this wasn't good because this observation convinced the police officers that Russell was lying. And it wasn't until three years later when the doctor was closely questioned about this stabbing and he admitted that in hindsight the wounds were too symmetrical to have been hesitation marks. So then he concluded that they were probably caused from when the outermost layer of skin is quickly dragged into the wound by the point of the ice pick on impact. So he said he regretted agreeing with the police that it may have been self-inflicted. But that was years later. Yeah, big deal. Two Highland Park police officers stayed in the ICU where Russell stayed overnight for observation, and they asked him if he would be willing to take a polygraph test. And he said he'd be happy to take one. He wanted to prove that he was telling the truth. He also asked the police to take the keys to the house where Lori was living and go look in her house. At six o'clock in the morning, the officers checked inside and outside of the house, which had been left unlocked. Lori wasn't home and hadn't been for about two weeks they thought by looking at the mail that had piled up in the mailbox. But she could have been there and not gotten the mail. I wouldn't put that past oh, her. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, her, her mental state is pretty precarious. So. Yeah. So they didn't find anything terribly unusual, but they did see her gun owner's ID card on the floor, along with a brown paper bag filled with cash. So that was kind of weird. The next day, Russell got out of the hospital, and he went with the police to the house where Lori was living, to look around and check if she was hiding in one of the closets. They didn't find her, but they did find the ice pick package. So the police contacted the store where it had come from, but the clerk couldn't identify Lori as the one who had bought the ice pick. But there was another clerk who remembered selling a glass cutter to her about a week earlier. And he and another male employee remembered Lori because they thought she was pretty, and they'd made comments about her large breasts because she wasn't wearing a bra. So, so the, that's the kind of thing it takes for guys to remember you, I guess. You see? <laughs> the police wondered if Russell had just planted that ice pick package at her house somewhat earlier because he had keys to the place. Yeah, I believe he owned the place. There was only circumstantial evidence, so it's just his word against hers. So the police pressed charges against Lori, but then Russell failed to polygraph and the charges were dropped. Yeah, and Lori was able to pass a polygraph. But, you know, if you're mentally ill like that, you probably can... You might be able to. You might believe these things. Sure. So around this same time, the calls to the old boyfriend, Steve, and his wife, Barbara, had persisted. And Lori was threatening their family, including their young children. These calls didn't stop until Steve's lawyer sent a letter to Lori's parents. So her parents are just always in the middle of these things, and they're not helpful. So Russell moved in with relatives for a short time while he had a security system installed. His sister Susie warned her children that if Aunt Lori came to the door, they were not to let her in and they should push the emergency button connected to their alarm system. She also went to Ravinia Elementary and the Young Men's Jewish Council Daycare Center where her children were enrolled and told them that she had a crazy sister-in-law and that under no circumstances should anyone be allowed to take the children from school without a note from her or her husband. Then, on November 7th, Lori went back to the gun store, and she bought a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson Terrier revolver for $245. 
and she was able to pick that one up three days later. I wonder if her psychiatrist could have written a letter or something to stop these gun sales. I'm not sure how that works. We have to look well, into that. Possibly the people selling the gun probably don't have any information. About no, but they didn't ask. And even if he was trying to stop it, he'd have to know where she bought the gun from. Now, I guess he'd have to send it to the state. Well, if there was a system to do that, which there probably wasn't. Right. So Russell's relatives, who were getting threatening calls from Lori, paid to have tracking devices installed in their phones. In early December, they tracked two hang-up calls to the phone in the house where Lori was living. So the Highland Park Police took the information, wrote out an arrest warrant for Lori. Then they went to the house to get her. I didn't make any calls, she said as they led her away, but she was bailed out and did not spend time at all in jail. Then on the Monday after Christmas, Lori returned to the gun store, and this time she bought a twenty two caliber semi-automatic Beretta for $209.15 and picked it up after another three-day waiting period. So now she's in possession of three guns. Yeah, and there's no excuse for owning three guns. Why would she need three guns? If she wanted one for protection, that doesn't explain why she keeps buying them. And she also bought a great deal of ammunition. Yeah, she was going to go to war. Then the very next afternoon, she made two harassing hang-up calls to Russell's office. Then over a time span of just six hours beginning after midnight, she made 55 more hang-up calls. So at this point, she's really gone over the edge. Oh, well, she sure has. The phone harassment over the holidays was so bad that four of Lori's targets asked for a special meeting with the Glencoe Director of Public Safety, Robert Bonneville. So they explained that Lori had been harassing them by telephone and that her behavior was alarming considering that ice pick stabbing, her problems in the shared apartment, and her issues with babysitting clients. She's babysitting children in this town, Russell's friend Scott Taylor said. The people who are in the gravest danger are the people who don't know anything about Lori. A child in this community is going to be killed unless you do something about her. But the public safety director said he couldn't prevent her from being a babysitter. This meeting lasted just about 45 minutes, and then everyone who'd gone in to complain and were worried about what she might do left frustrated. But they did take some action. After the meeting, the Glencoe Department of Public Safety issued a news bulletin telling parents to obtain thorough information about their babysitters, including references, make and model of the car, and social security number. But that doesn't really do anything in this circumstance. No, it doesn't. It's something, but it's not, not real helpful, is it? No. She had no job and she wasn't taking any classes at this point, so she needed something to do. Her parents thought that if she was busy, she'd move forward and put the divorce behind her. So that's delusional. So she was answering babysitting ads in the help wanted section of the local newspaper. And as long as the children weren't too young, she felt like she could connect with them and they would accept her for who she was. And she really did impress her first few families by being very reliable, mature, and kind. The Rush family of Winnetka, to whom she identified herself as Lori Porter, for no reason we know of, was happy to recommend her to their friends with children. So she took their five children to the park on the 4th of July to see the fireworks, and they just loved her. The mother, Marion Rush, was thrilled to have found a sitter who was willing to work weekends, too. So it finally seemed that Lori might have found something she was good at, and Norm and Edith were pretty hopeful. Then after her divorce from Russell was final, Lori lived with her parents for a while. Then she decided she wanted to return to college. So she leased half of an apartment, sharing a kitchen with a male renter. And she was a terrible roommate, to say the least. What a surprise. Least. So she would leave newspapers and food wrappers all over the floor of her room in the hallway. And she would pile up dirty and clean clothes together in this huge cardboard box in the center of her room. Then I think one of the worst things was that she would leave meat spoiling in the oven. And she would prepare more food than she could eat and just leave it to spoil. And of course, there were other odd things she did. Like she never used her bare hands to touch anything. So when she had to open a door, she had to use a towel wrapped around her hands, or she'd pull her hands inside the sleeves of her top, or she'd even wear gloves. Then early in the summer, she followed one of the roommate's friends into the bathroom and stood there watching him urinate. When he was finished, he looked over at her and she asked if she could shake his hand. 
Jeez. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Then she often would say she was going to play tennis, but no one ever came to the apartment, and instead she would just ride the elevator up and down the seven-story building all afternoon. And when she wasn't on the elevator, she was often just sitting blank-eyed in front of the TV in the downstairs lounge. And the TV was only on sometimes. Sometimes it wasn't even on. Yeah, the roommate felt sorry for Lori, at least when he wasn't angry with her. Lori told him that she worked in the admitting office of a hospital, but then she told another resident that she was in the nursing program. Time and again, Lori would reinvent her life, projecting new and better identities onto herself. So her roommate is worried enough about her behavior that he began to sleep with a knife and a baseball bat. Her behavior was very erratic, and she told the roommate that she owned a gun. She had started to show a weird fascination with meat. Now her mother would bring groceries for her. Lori would unwrap the raw meat and put it on a plate in the refrigerator where it would drip down on the other food. When she put some in the freezer, she let blood drip into the ice cube trays. That's gross. And the maintenance man found uncooked slabs of beef hidden in strange places. He found a piece stashed under the carpet in the hallway, and he found several pieces stacked behind chair cushions in the hallway. Now, occasionally, Lori would eat the meat that she was hoarding, even when it had gone bad. When her roommate told her parents that he was worried about her, Edith shrugged and said nothing. And when the roommate tried talking to Norm, Norm told him that the real problem in Lori's life was that her ex-husband was harassing her. Yeah, so I don't know if Lori was telling them that Russell was harassing her, and they actually believed that, or if they were just in complete denial. I'm not sure how that worked. But the conditions in that apartment didn't improve, and the living room began to smell of urine, and then small puddles were found in front of the television. Then there were also small fires set on the carpet. So it's definitely escalating. Yeah, it's her uh, rather tenuous grip on reality is really slipping away here. Yeah, one student in the building found his clothing cut up and all of his books destroyed, and he believed that Lori had done it. Later that same night, she was found in a garbage room, sleeping naked on a pile of trash. So she was curled up in the fetal position and she covered herself up with a plastic trash bag. Now at that point, she should have been taken right to the hospital. That's just really bad. She's in bad shape if she's doing that. Really? But as things got worse, Norm was finally able to convince Lori to move back home. The building's maintenance guy scrubbed down the apartment after Lori left, and he found garbage in all the cabinets above the kitchen sink. Her bed was so badly damaged by urine that he had to throw away the mattress and the platform board. He also saw the urine stains on several spots in the carpet, so she's a very disturbed person. Russell left his townhouse when his uh, private detective that he had hired lost track of Lori's whereabouts. Soon, though, after he was living in his new apartment, he looked out his window and saw Laurie standing in the parking lot looking toward him. Then his girlfriend began receiving hang-up calls again. So we're regressing back there. Oh yeah, she was threatening to kill Russell and the girlfriend. On March 12, 1988, Laurie slipped into a lab at the university hospital. A technician saw her looking in a cabinet where chemicals were stored. And three days later, employees discovered that arsenic and lead solutions were missing from the cabinet. And Lori had already been to the library and stolen books, the Handbook of Poisoning, Poisoning by Drugs and Chemicals, and Poison Antidotes and Anecdotes. Yeah, that's quite a title. I'd like to yeah. see how that book reads. So Lori had failed at everything except babysitting, but her mental state was definitely deteriorating. One set of parents, the Williamsons, came home one day to find their garage door openers missing and knife slashes on their leather couches and chair. Lori had been there babysitting their children. But Lori told them that a young man who said he was a neighbor had knocked on the door and asked to use the phone. She said she'd left him in the kitchen while she went upstairs to get one of the children to identify the man, but when she came back downstairs, he had left. So the Williamsons estimated the damages at about $1,700, and they called the police. Lori did go to the police station for an interview, but she stuck to that story, which most people were not believing. Huh, I wouldn't think. Then she tried to blame Russell. So the Williamson family dropped the complaint, and they stopped hiring her to babysit. But this made her angry, so she started making hang-up calls to their house for several weeks. So she could really hold a grudge. Boy, I guess... 
So she posted handwritten notes on bulletin boards in libraries and grocery stores, which read, Experienced babysitter, 25 years old, just finished college, living at home in Glencoe, has own car, references, 250 an hour, call me. So on May 19th, Lori was told by one of her babysitting clients, the Rushes, that she wouldn't be needed to babysit anymore because the family was moving away to New York. The mother must not have known how unstable Lori was because she agreed to let Lori take her two young sons to a fair the next morning. But Lori's mental state was completely unraveling by now. So I think all of us have dealt with some mental illness in our families or friend group, but Lori's illness was very extreme. And her illness really peaked with anger and thoughts of violence. In many ways, this was a perfect storm. Her illness was recognized by her ex-husband and most people who knew her at all, but her parents' response and their enabling of her behavior really allowed her to act out with violence. So that night, Lori stayed up and prepared Rice Krispie treats and juice boxes. She injected the marshmallow mixture and juice boxes with the arsenic she'd stolen. Then she woke up early on May 20th and delivered some of the poisoned items to different homes and some frat houses in Glencoe, Highland Park, and Winnetka. At about 6.30 a.m. that Friday morning, she walked next door to a house owned by friends of Norm and Edith, and she left a poisoned juice box in their mailbox. Then she went back home and loaded up her father's car with supplies. She put her handguns, chemicals, and ammunition in the trunk, put the poisoned food and drinks on the passenger seat. She drove south from her parents' house and she stopped at the home of former babysitting clients and dropped off a leaking container of poisoned Hawaiian punch. At 6.45, she went to Highland Park. Former neighbors of Lori and Russell, the Lapatas, heard their screen door open and close at 6.55. When the husband went to see what was going on, he found a leaking juice pouch between the front door and the screen door. Lori had also left Rice Krispie treats and a juice pouch in the front door of the Friedheim house. Scott Friedheim was a fraternity brother at Northwestern, whom Lori had fixated on after he gave her a ride once, so it didn't take much to set her off. She made several more stops, and her last stop was at the house of another former neighbor, where she left a punctured juice box in the mailbox. Then she drove north towards the Rush house in Winnetka, and the Rushes were the family that were moving. Right. She was going to take the two boys to the fair or something, right? Right. So she arrived at the Rush's house to pick up the two boys, it's Patrick and Carl, and she gave them cups of the poison milk. Fortunately, the boys thought it tasted bad and they dumped it while she wasn't looking. She left behind poison treats on the kitchen counter. And after leaving the Rush's house with the two boys, she drove to Ravinia Elementary, the school in Highland Park where Russell's sister Susie's nine-year-old boy Brian went to school. So she parked the car out front, and she told Patrick and Carl to wait for her. She removed a bag with a drawstring from the trunk and carried it into the school. And once inside, she saw a cardboard refrigerator box that had been cut and decorated to look like a house. So she put her bag down on the floor inside the playhouse and set fire to the drawstring. The bottles inside held stolen flammable liquids, and Lori figured that when they ignited, they would cause an explosion that would damage the school building and fill it up with uh, noxious gas. The bag began to burn. Lori backed away and started running towards the door. Now a teacher who was walking a group of students down the hall saw the fire and extinguished it. So luckily she didn't really know what she was doing to cause an explosion. Yeah, that's for sure. So Lori then drove the Rush boys half a mile away to the Young Men's Jewish Council, a daycare center where her ex-sister-in-law Susie's five-year-old was enrolled. When she pulled into the parking lot, Lori told the two boys they should come with her to pick up something from the office. Then she picked up an empty plastic garbage bag from the passenger seat and pulled it on, sticking her arms and head through holes she had cut out. But when Patrick told her that she looked funny, she removed the bag. But then she was prevented from entering the school when she tried to go in with a full gas can. So after stopping several more times to drop off poisoned food and drinks at different houses, Lori drove back to the Rush home. Patrick and Carl didn't seem to mind the change in plans, and their mother Marion invited Lori to stay and keep the children company while she did some laundry. Now Lori had a pack of matches and a shopping bag filled with bottles. I don't know why the mother didn't question her yeah. about that, but she set the matches on a tabletop in the hallway near the front door, 
and carried the bag with her, following Marion and the boys to the basement laundry room. She made some idle chit-chat with Marion, then she stood up and said that she had to get something from her car. Patrick and Carl were bored, and they were ready to follow Lori up the stairs, but Marion told them to stay with her. So halfway up the stairs, Lori pulled out a large flask filled with gasoline and poured it on the carpeted treads of the stairs. Then she opened a second container and set it down. Then she ran to the front hallway to get her matches. So she returned to the basement stairs, lit a match, and touched the lighted end to the wet stairs. And the flames jumped up, and the smoke detector went off within seconds. Oh, fire, Lori called out, and she locked the back door, and then she locked the front door behind her before she left. So by the time Marion reached the bottom of the stairs, the fire was moving toward her, and the air was filling with black smoke, so they're trapped in the basement. Yeah, the doors are locked. Yeah. So she called the boys and led them toward a far corner of the basement away from the fire, and a window six feet off the ground was the only way out. So she was able to break the glass and hoist each of her boys out, but then she had to stand on a pile of old suitcases to get herself out. They did all get out, but she had some injuries. Yeah, but that's amazing that she was able to do all that. That is. I mean, Thank they, goodness. They could have all died. Oh, absolutely. And that was the plan, I imagine. And why? Because the family was moving? Yeah, she wasn't going to work for them anymore. Yeah. Weird. Very weird. So after Lori left Mary and Rush and her two boys to burn to death in their basement, she put another flask of gasoline into a garbage can by the door, opened the trunk of her father's car, and took out her three handguns. She put them on the passenger seat next to her, and then drove four blocks to Hubbard Woods Elementary. This is a one-story school in a Winnetka neighborhood. She parked on the road at the front of the school, and it's 10.25 a.m. at this point. The doors of the school were unlocked, but Hubbard Woods had a policy that all guests needed to report to the main office first. However, no one saw Laurie as she circled halfway around the outside of the building and walked through the double doors by the gym and entered a boy's bathroom, and then she re-entered the hallway. Yeah, so kindergarten teacher Phyllis McMillan, whose classroom was next to that bathroom, looked out into the hall at just that moment. When she saw Lori pass by, McMillan had never seen her before, and as Lori continued toward the principal's office by the main entrance, she passed Anne Hardy, a teacher who was on break and standing in the doorway of her classroom while her students were in gym class. So Hardy said hello, but Lori didn't answer and she just kept walking. Then, just past 10.30, Lori opened the door of classroom 7 and walked in. Twenty-four children were sitting at tables and desks, grouped together around the room, and the teacher was explaining to them about the written part of their bicycle safety test. So things can be quite mysterious in our home after dark. Like last night, for example. It was just a night like any other, we ate a lovingly prepared Greek salad, drank some beers, and chatted about our next true crime case. Then suddenly, I was out of there. But there was no need for Dick to worry. He didn't canvass the neighborhood or fill out a missing persons report. He knew that I was just off in my favorite little corner of the house, scoring some quality time with best fiends. Less experienced partners might have wondered about my whereabouts, but he enjoys best fiends just as much as I do. Yeah, others may have been surprised by Jill's disappearing act, but we've been together for a long time, and we have this understanding. Best Fiends is a mobile puzzle game with thousands of levels and new adventures each time you play. Whether you have minutes or hours, it's always right there for you on your phone or tablet. Perfect for waiting rooms, quiet moments at home, or any time you need a fun escape. And with offline play, you'll never be stranded if you lose your internet connection. I've just reached level 902, so I'm right there nipping at Jill's heels. And that hasn't gone unnoticed. There are brand new challenges and game events that pop up all year round, so you always get a chance to earn exclusive in-game items, characters, and rewards. Download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. So this May 20th was the first time that eight-year-old Nikki Corwin was allowed to ride his bike to school. He had been studying bicycle safety and the rules of the road for the past two weeks at school. And this morning, 
he and his second grade classmates at Hubbard Woods Elementary would be taking outdoor and indoor tests. If he passed, he would be allowed to ride to school every day for the rest of the year. Now, he was running a little late, but he is super excited as he dashed out of his house in his Chicago Bears jersey, sweatpants, and sneakers. His brother, 11-year-old Michael, was already on his bike in the driveway waiting for him. So Nicky Corwin was a bright and friendly boy with freckles across his nose. His mother, Linda, was a full-time mother to her sons, Nicky, Michael, and Johnny. Her husband, Joel, was a lawyer in Chicago, and Joel had met Linda in 1966 when they were both in high school and taking summer classes at Northwestern University. So they'd kept touch after the summer, and in Linda's sophomore year of college, she married Joel and transferred to Yale to be part of the university's first co-ed class. They both graduated in 1971. Joel finished law school and took a job in Chicago, while Linda finished her master's degree at Loyola University. Nikki, their second child, was born in 1980, and he was athletic from an early age, and he excelled in soccer, baseball, football, and track. But he was also artistic, writing and illustrating his own storybooks. Nikki's bedroom had a Chicago Cubs poster on the wall above his bed, a Michael Jordan poster on a far wall, and a toy basketball hoop hanging from the top of his closet door. Although he was short for his age at just under four feet, Nicky was determined that he would be a professional athlete when he grew up. So Nicky's regular teacher at Hubbard Woods wasn't in school that Friday. The substitute was Miss Moses, who had filled in a lot that year, so she knew the kids. She took them all outside at 9 o'clock for the riding part of their bicycle safety test. The gym teacher supervised the obstacle course, and everyone passed the test. Then they walked back together to classroom 7 for the written half of the exam. So Lori entered that classroom, and after she entered, she walked to the front and stood next to the teacher, Miss Moses. Miss Moses stopped her lesson to ask Lori if she needed help. Lori didn't say anything, and she was kind of sloppy and young-looking, so Miss Moses guessed that she was a college student there to observe the class. So Lori sat down at a table in the front of the room, and Miss Moses was kind of bothered by her lifeless-looking face. She didn't engage with her or even look at the kids, but she was trying to make the best of things, so she handed Lori a copy of the test she was about to give the kids, thinking maybe Lori would show some interest. But after a few minutes passed, Lori stood up suddenly, dropped the bicycle test on the floor, and walked out of the classroom. Back in the hallway, she saw six-year-old Robert Trossman at the drinking fountain. She asked him if he had to go to the bathroom, and then she dragged him by one arm into the nearby boy's bathroom. She withdrew one of her guns from her waistband and fired at him. Her first shot missed and hit the tile between two urinals, but the second shot hit Robert in his upper chest, exiting through his lower back, and the little boy fell to the floor. Then as Lori turned to leave, she saw that two more little boys had walked in behind her and had seen her shoot him. So she pointed her gun at these boys and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire and they were able to run away. They found their teacher, who followed them back to the bathroom, found Robert laying on the floor bleeding and called for help. But Lori had returned to classroom seven. The kids there were sitting in small groups talking over the questions on their test, and Miss Moses was answering the question of one of them in the front room. When Lori entered, she said, put the children in a corner, and she pulled her revolver from her waistband. This is a gun, she said, and I have another one. It's real, I'll show you. So the teacher grabbed Lori's right wrist and began wrestling with her. In the struggle, she was able to force out two live twenty-two caliber rounds to eject from the gun. She managed to pull Lori over to the door of the classroom, and she yelled into the hall that there was a woman in her classroom with a gun. The only person in the hall was a teacher's aide who had a serious ear infection and couldn't really hear. So Lori was able to break free, and she pulled her thirty-two out of her shorts. She waved her two guns at the children and ordered them to get in the corner. But the children were frozen, they were confused and afraid. So Lori walked up to a group of three children who were near a wall and held her gun out. Then she started to shoot, critically wounding five children, and she killed Nikki Corwin. Now Lori fled the school in her father's car after that. Then she crashed into a tree. She removed her blood-soaked shorts and ran with a plastic bag tied around her waist. She reloaded her revolver, crossed a backyard, 
Entering the unlocked home of Ruth Andrew, she burst into the kitchen and told Ruth that her car had broken down and she needed to use her phone. Now Ruth had been talking to her son, Phil Andrew. He was 20 years old and he has just come home the day before from the University of Illinois, where he was a talented swimmer. He was still dressed in a white t-shirt and red gym shorts. Lori was wearing her Arizona College of Medicine t-shirt and the trash bag, which she held together in front with the same hand that was holding two guns. So Lori claimed she'd been raped and shot her attacker, and the police were after her. She used their phone to call her mother, and Edith answered, and Lori told her mother she'd done something terrible. She added that people would not understand and now she would have to kill herself. So Ruth and her son Phil were sympathetic at first. They tried to convince Lori that she didn't have to worry about the police because she'd acted in self-defense. Ruth gave her a pair of her daughter's pants to wear, and Phil was able to pick up one of her guns while she was putting the pants on and hide it from her. As she was talking on the phone with her mother, Phil took the phone and explained about the rape and shooting, and he asked Edith if she would come and pick up her daughter. But Edith said she couldn't come because she didn't have a car. Oh, God. I know. She said they'd have to wait for her husband to get home. So Phil was stunned by how calm and detached Lori's mother seemed. And she asked him if he could make sure that her daughter got home safely. And he said, well, I'll try. And then he hung up the phone. Then Phil's father, Raymond, came home. And he sat down at the kitchen counter as Phil explained the situation. At 11.07 a.m., Lori called Edith back. No one will understand, she told her mother. It's terrible. So now she's making the family nervous, the Andrew family. She's pacing and waving her gun with her finger on the trigger. Phil asked for the phone and she handed it to him. And he begged Edith to come, suggesting maybe she could call a cab or borrow a car from a neighbor. But Edith refused to come. So Phil was frustrated and scared, of course, and he passed the phone to his father, who spoke with Edith. And he was more stern. He said, tell your daughter to give up her gun. We're all in danger here. I just came in and the police are down on the corner setting up. You've got to tell her to give up the gun. But Lori hit the base of the phone, cutting off the call then. Raymond had Lori call her mother back and he tried to convince Edith to come and get her daughter. Finally, completely fed up with Edith's inaction, he handed the phone back to Lori, who spent several minutes just apologizing to her mother. After Lori hung up, Phil convinced her to let his mother go outside to meet his sister's school bus. He had two sisters coming home. Down the block, the mother ran up to a police officer and told him what was going on in her house. Now back in the kitchen, Phil was still trying to get Lori to hand over the gun. He and Raymond tried to leave, but Lori yelled at them and pointed the gun at them. So Phil was able to convince her to let his father leave. But then, without saying anything, she just fired into Phil's chest and shot him. And as he fell, he managed to move around a corner into the pantry. But as soon as she'd shot Phil, Lori left the kitchen. She found the staircase and walked upstairs. And at the landing, she wandered down a hall past a bedroom door. Phil, meanwhile, had backed all the way out of the kitchen and through the door leading to the yard. So as soon as he was clear, he staggered for the gate that led to the driveway trying to get help. So this is just an amazing scene. It's just the chaos that must have been going on. But Edith is just really weird. It's Wait for my husband to get home? Are you kidding me? Don't you think Edith should have called 911 immediately and said what was going on? It's not convenient for me now. I can't do this. No, and they don't get any better, those parents. So Russell, Dan, and Norm Wasserman were brought to the house by police. But after discussing Lori's history with Russell, the police decided to have Norm alone try to talk to his daughter. So it was about 7 p.m. when a SWAT team entered the house while Norm tried to speak to Lori with a bullhorn. So several hours had passed. Yeah, many hours. Yes. After Norm had left with the police to try to get Lori to come out of the house peacefully, Edith told the county prosecutor that she felt sorry for all of the mothers of the children and their families. She said she had no idea Lori was like this. Well, that's bullshit. She said that when she talked to her, Lori had apologized and said it was not Edith's fault. Well, Edith needs to hear, right? Well, yeah. Doesn't that strike you that she's really concerned about covering her own ass at this point? Right. She's she, kind of awful. She added that the night before, Lori had been so excited about being with the children. She made Rice Krispies treats and she brought them all special drinks. And she's practically dancing around the kitchen. And Edith said, uh, this sounds terrible for a mother to say, but you know, She's in so much trouble, I think it would be better if she didn't come out of this alive. 
Well, there's Mother of the Year award right yeah, there. Yeah, fuck this lady. Isn't she the worst? She's terrible. Yeah, I really feel like she should be held partially responsible in some way for this. Wouldn't you like to? I'd like to wring her neck. But by this time, Lori had already shot herself and died. Yeah, she was up in a bedroom of the Andrew house. I think it was the, the little girl's room. So over the next several hours, the police learned about Lori's attack on the many other people all over the North Shore. It was announced on the news that people shouldn't eat or drink any food or drinks found in their mailboxes, and that the schools where Lori had visited should throw away all of their snacks. The warnings were only partly successful because over a dozen people did eat or drink the poison treats and juices. Now fortunately though, Lori hadn't understood that the arsenic solution she had stolen was very diluted. It was 1,000 parts per million. So her sickest victim was a Northwestern University sophomore who had eaten a Rice Krispies treat. And he did have to be hospitalized, but he was released a few hours later. I'm just wondering, so you, you find these crispy treats <laughs> Or juice boxes that are dripping. Yeah. And you decide to eat them. Well, it's a college student. Think uh, about our college student. Yeah, that's true. He'll eat yeah. anything he finds yeah. in the house. Once I think about that, I just... <laughs> they it, just forage around. Yeah. But the other people said they tasted terrible, so... <laughs> yeah. It's just funny, really. But thank, well, thank God out. nobody was killed. Or, right. Yeah. Now, if her plan had been successful, she would have fatally poisoned over 50 people shot to death over a dozen school kids, killed three members of the Rush family, and burned down two schools with over 400 children inside. Wow. Patrick and Carl, kids she babysat, were very upset that she was dead. They couldn't understand what she had done, but they knew they loved her. Isn't that sad? She tried to burn them to death in their basement. Yeah. But they didn't understand. So aside from Nikki Corwin and herself, all of Lori Dan's victims did survive. But Phil Andrew was very seriously injured, and he became involved in gun control issues, even giving interviews from his hospital bed as he recovered. Investigations of Lori's crimes were definitely hampered by her parents' refusal to be interviewed by the police or even give any public access to her psychiatric records. Now you think they'd want to find some reason for this and maybe help so future things like this don't happen. You but would it, think. It just seems like they were more concerned with covering things up. Right, exactly. Because they said over and over again that they were embarrassed, which is not an appropriate word for this. Eventually, Lori's records were released to the police, but that was by a court order. Unfortunately, only a cursory search was done of Lori's bedroom in her parents' house, and when investigators returned to do a deeper search, her parents had cleaned the room and even destroyed potential evidence. After reviewing the Winnetka Police Department Task Force's report on Lori Dan, Chief of Police criticized Norman Edith Wasserman for their failure to recognize the threat that Lori was to the community and their refusal to cooperate in her psychiatric care. The final draft was released on June 15th and read in part, We are convinced that opportunities existed prior to May 20th for Miss Dan's condition to have been successfully addressed. Unfortunately, it is apparent these opportunities were missed because critical information was not sufficiently provided to police authorities or mental health practitioners to adequately address the deteriorating mental state which Dan exhibited. It was also apparent that many opportunities for prosecution were lost either through withdrawal of criminal complaints, insufficient evidence or lack of co cooperation from Ms. Dan or other interested parties. Yes, yeah, so the police also were criticized for not containing Lori's bedroom as part of the crime scene. You know, that initial search should have been more thorough. You would think. Yeah. But they did find two newspaper clippings in the room before the parents cleaned it out. And one was about a random shooting where two people were killed. And the other was about a depressed man who'd attempted to kill himself, but he'd survived and his resulting brain injury had cured his obsessive compulsive disorder. So it seems she was thinking about hurting herself and others for some time. Looks that way. Yeah. There was also a lot of criticism aimed at her psychiatrists and at the police for not recognizing how dangerous she'd been. Yeah, she was on psychiatric medications, including an afrinil, which is a generic clomipramine. So this drug was looked at as a possible cause for her behavior, but it was ruled out. Yeah, I think she was also on lithium. She had lithium in her blood. 
but there's no evidence that that would cause anyone to be violent either. That's like a mood stabilizer. Right. So we don't normally cover cases of school shootings, but with this one, I think we have enough time that's passed where we can kind of look at it objectively. Also, I can't help but notice how much worse this would have been if Lori had gotten her hands on an assault rifle. That's really scary to think about. And it's just so sad to think about how many instances there were when someone could have gotten help for Lori, but they didn't. And I have to put much of this on her parents. After all the threats, dangerous behavior, and then buying weapons. I mean, what the hell? She should have been institutionalized. Absolutely. So before we move ahead with feedback, I'd just like to take a minute to update everyone on our members-only show, True Crime Brewery Premium. Listeners who support TCB by subscribing to our premium feed are an essential part of our show, and every subscriber is on the same level and receives ad-free versions of all the episodes, plus a bonus members-only episode at least once a month, and a gift and a handwritten thank you note. There are also options where you can pay monthly, quarterly, or annually. So TCB Premium has been, gosh, I think it's close to five years now it's been out. So there are plenty of episodes to binge there as well. So if you enjoy having TCB in your life, you dislike ads, and you like to get gifts in the mail, please consider subscribing, and you can do that at tiegrabber.com. You can also go to tiegrabber.com and leave us a voicemail. Just click on the little leave the voicemail box at the top of the website, and you can record it right on your device. And we really love to get voicemails. It's time for listener feedback. So what have we got for feedback, Dickie? I have a couple of voicemails and uh, email for you today. And the first voicemail is from Elizabeth. She has a case suggestion. All right, let's see what Elizabeth had to say. Hi, Joe and Dick. This is Elizabeth calling from Narberth, PA, which is just outside of Philadelphia. I have been binge listening to all of your older episodes, and I just finished the Lady in the Box episode, which was great, like everything else you do. I have a case suggestion for you. It's about a two-month-old baby named Zachary Dacry. That's D-A-C-R-I. I always thought it was Dacry, like the drink, but it's spelled Zachary, D-A-C-R-I. Anyway, his mother was accused of drowning him when he was two months old and dismembering his body and dumping the remains in two creeks, reportedly because she couldn't stand the crying. Um, I hope this is something you could look into. Um, I remember it from my youth. And I wanted to thank you for always doing a great job and always having great cases and for giving me something to keep me company. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Your kind words mean more than you know. Yes, they do. Having said that, and, and I'll check into this, see what we can get for details. Sure. But I am pretty reluctant to talk about a two-month-old that got drowned and dismembered by his mother. Of course. It I guess it kind of depends on the background of the mother and what was going on, but I definitely see what you're saying there. Oh, we'll look. There has to be mental illness there, right? Or could someone be that evil? I guess they could, but that would be really exceptionally evil. Yes, it would. Postpartum psychosis, maybe, but she didn't mention that, so we'll have to look into that. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. And what is our next voicemail? I see we have one more we're going to play. We have one from Linda L., Hey, Dick and Jill. This is Linda from Texas. I'm a longtime listener, and I have sent in a few voicemails and emails over the years. And, by the way, I'm still waiting for you to do the Danielle Van Damme case. That's just a joke. Um, I know you probably don't want to do a child case, and I don't expect it. But anyway, I do want to say that I've gone back and I've re-listened to some of the older episodes that you did back in 2016. And I must say that you two have come a long way. Not only your recording equipment quality has gone up, but also your ease of speaking and the banter that you do back and forth. Which, by the way, the, your banter is the main reason why 
I continued listening to your podcast after the first couple episodes. Um, I do have a case suggestion today. It's the case of Dan Brophy. Brophy is spelled B-R-O-P-H-Y. I watched the case on Court TV. It's Oregon versus uh, Nancy Brophy. And um, this case is one where she was convicted of killing her husband. He was a beloved instructor at a culinary institute. Everybody loved him. And she was a not-so-successful author. She had a couple of romance novels that she published. And an article that was published online, ironically entitled, How to Kill Your Husband. By the way, the court didn't allow that article into evidence, so it did not sway the jury. It would be interesting, though, to hear your take on this very, very interesting case. I must say, it's one of those cases where... Nancy Brophy was too cute. She thought she was going to pull off the perfect murder. She did a lot of clever things, but she made a lot of really stupid mistakes. And ultimately, she was convicted. And I think what put the nail in her coffin was that she testified at her trial, which is almost always a mistake. Um, I don't have any beer suggestions for Oregon because I don't know of any craft breweries or any good beer from Oregon. But I do have a Texas beer, which Texas is in, always in the news, so there's going to be another Texas case at some point. It's St. Arnold's Brewery, and the name of the beer is Juicy IPA, and this is right up Jill's Alley. It's a citrusy, real juicy-tasting beer. The name suits it. Anyway, cheers, and thank you for all you do. Well, thanks a lot, Linda. Yes, we will definitely have another Texas case. Actually, we have one scheduled in September. I'm looking at our calendar on the wall right now. So what do you think about the uh, Brophy case, Dick? Have you looked into it at all? Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and the draw on it was that the woman convicted had written that book on how to kill your husband. This sounds familiar. It's, it's pretty recent. Yeah. So... Okay. I, th I thought that was worth a look. Maybe give it a little while just to see what shakes down after the trial. But uh, yeah, I'd, I think that'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be great if we could watch the trial. I love to watch a trial. I'll check you know it that. out. And plus the spousal killing, for some reason, it's just up my alley. It's one of my favorites, especially when they make stupid mistakes and plot it out. Well, I hope the spousal killing isn't giving you ideas. No, not at all. Okay. I just think that most of them are so stupid or greedy, and it's just right up my alley of things to talk about. Like, you like to do doctors, I like to do relationships, I guess. Okay. Yeah. You got it. Okay. So I'm going to read one email before we uh, sign right. off we for have, the day. Uh, we have an email yep. from Lucia. Okay. And she writes, I just want to thank you for my gift. I received a big surprise when it arrived today. I wasn't expecting you to send something all the way down to Australia. Well, no problem. We always send it to our listeners wherever they live because I figure if you're going to invest your time in us, I can invest in a little postage. So Lucia goes on to say, I can't tell you how much I look forward to your episodes each week. I find your banter very amusing and your material so well-researched and engaging. Thank you again. And she goes on, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of or covered the case of the Claremont serial killings, which took place in my hometown of Perth, Western Australia. If not, it might be worth a look. The case involved the disappearance of three young women from a wealthy suburb in Perth. It remained unsolved for almost two and a half decades until 2020 and has been described as one of the longest and most expensive cases in the state's history. Having been in my early 20s at the time of the disappearances, I can vividly recall the atmosphere of fear associated with leaving night spots in the area. It was such a foreign feeling. Perth is located on the west coast of Australia, on the Indian Ocean, and is one of the most isolated cities in the world. It is also very beautiful. Yeah, and this is, uh, I just quickly looked up a couple things. This occurred in the, the mid-1990s, 96, 97. Uh, three women disappeared over the, the course of that time from the Claremont suburb of Perth. Now, 20 years went by and a suspect was found and judged guilty of two of the murders. The body of the third victim has not been discovered. So we got that. Mm -hmm. And then there are at least two other women who have disappeared around that same time. Might, might have been victims of this person. We don't know. Okay. So there's two that he's convicted of and maybe two or three or more that he is responsible for. Okay. 
So it has been a little while since we've done an Australian case, so I think it's something maybe we could move towards the top of the list to look into. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening and for your feedback. We always appreciate it so much, and we hope that you have a good day. And we'll see you next time at the quiet end. We'll save a couple seats for you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.